that's what I want to talk about today, is the release of the Holy Spirit through participation. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus, as he was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20 says, at once they left their nets. To me, participation means actively, willingly, engaging, paying attention, listening, and responding to an invitation. Jesus said, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The second thing participation means is being actively willing to act upon what you hear, to respond, to do what you can with what you have right now in the moment. So many people say, oh, I'll do that later, or, you know, that was inspiring, but I'm not so interested right now. Being participating means that you're willing to go now. And the third thing is that you're actively willing to continue to focus on what you've begun, to continue the work. Success, one man said, is 90% showing up. But I want to say the critical factor is continuing all the way to the end. But we must leave the results up to God. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4, it says, And while they were gathered together, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. It's getting near the last day of 40 days he's been been with them after being raised from the dead. It says, while they were gathered together, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of the Father promised, which you have heard me discuss. For John baptized with water, but a few days later, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now in the very next verse, it says, so when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time uh, restore the kingdom to Israel? They were expecting Jesus to do that work. But in fact, Jesus was sending the Holy Spirit to them to go into all nations and make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all the things that I have commanded you to do. You see, we have a job to do, and it's the Holy Spirit that empowers us for that work. In verse 9 of the same passage, it says, After he said this, they watched as he was taken up, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And as they were looking intently at the sky as he was going, suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking at the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. You know, there is, maybe some of you know who Tommy Lasorda is. He's the retired Hall of Fame manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers. He once said there are three types of baseball players. Those who make it happen, those who watch it happen, and those who just scratch their heads and wonder what just happened. And you know, there's a lot of people in churches like that too. There are people who are active, who participate, who get involved, who make it happen. You know, we can pray, but we need to pray and do. It's not just enough to pray. There are those people who watch other people do it. They go in church and they fill the seats and they love to see a good message and hear good entertainment and good worship. But we need to be willing and active participants in the fellowship of the body. And then, of course, there are those people who just come and visit and they scratch their heads. They don't get it at all. They say, what in the heck just happened? We do not want to be in that category at all. So what did these disciples do? Well, they went to Jerusalem. They obeyed Jesus. They actively waited for what Jesus was promising. But they didn't even understand what that would be. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Another translation says they were in one accord. They were in unity of mind and spirit. You see, Jesus had told them to go to Jerusalem and wait. They did this. But an important note is that they responded by obeying. 
This is their first act of participation. John 14, verse 15 and 16 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, a helper to be with you forever, the Holy Spirit. You see the connection? If you obey and love one another, what's going to happen? In that obedience, the Holy Spirit will begin to move upon you. You see, they responded by going to Jerusalem, waiting, and being in unity. There is great power and comfort in being in unity. John 13, uh, but there is more we need. Psalm 133 says this, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony or unity. It is like fine oil on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon falling on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing of life forevermore. You see, when there is a unity among us, when there is fellowship, true unity, special things begin to happen. Verse 2 of uh, Acts chapter 2 says, Suddenly there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and came to rest where they were sitting. On each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Then Peter did something. He stood up. He began to participate. He lifted his voice and he spoke to the crowd. Men of Judea, let this be known to you and listen carefully to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only the third hour of the day, nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Verse 17 says, this. it quotes it. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. You see, God wants to do this, but we must participate in the invitation to allow the Holy Spirit to come into us and take really a residence in our heart and take a, dom a dominant role in our lives. It says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. Even on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. You see, God wants to use everyone, whether they're in the highest, most educated rank in society or the lowest, most uneducated part of the society, God wants to use all of us by his Holy Spirit. And in verse 21 of that same passage, it says, And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, the action of the Holy Spirit does something really marvelous. It leads people to Jesus. When I was in that group of Muslims in that uh, soup kitchen area, I had a wonderful experience of praying the sinner's prayer with seven Muslim people seated around a schoolroom table. It was an amazing thing. So it says in verse 42 of this passage in Acts chapter 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. You see, they continued obeying what God said to stay in this fellowship and unity of focus, vision, spirit, and love, really to encourage each other in the Lord and the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 43, and a sense of awe came over everyone, and the apostles performed many signs and wonders. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they shared with anyone who was in need. Isn't that a beautiful expression? of caring, not just in word, but in action, in deed. Verse 46, with one accord, they continued to meet daily in the temple and to break bread from house to house, sharing their meals with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor from all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You see, this is the ultimate goal of the Holy Spirit. He not only wants to give us a good feeling, he not only wants us to feel empowered, but he wants us to be useful 
toward his calling on our life. He wants to bring us into our destiny and then give us the tools and the power to fulfill the things he calls us to do. Remember that the goal is the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God on earth. Jesus prayed, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is he talking about? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Matthew 10, verse 7 and 8, Jesus said, As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. You see, this is the work of the kingdom, but we can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. We must not only have the power of the Holy Spirit, but we must be led by the Holy Spirit. Jesus, he said this in John chapter 5, verse 17. To this very day, my Father is at work, and I too am working. In verse 19, he says, Truly, truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself unless he sees the Father doing it. You see, Jesus was so dependent upon his Father and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to do what he saw the Father doing. And in the same way, we need that same Holy Spirit. But the Bible tells us that we cannot live according to the flesh. We cannot just do what we want, and now we have gifts and power to to know what's on the heart of God or to pray for the sick. We must have the heart of God in whatever we do. It says this, and I'm going to pray in a moment, in Galatians 5, verse 3, verse 3. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? After starting in the Spirit, are you now finishing in the flesh? You see, once we have the Holy Spirit active in our lives, we need to continue to listen to the Holy Spirit, be led, corrected by the Holy Spirit, and be brought out of our comfort zone to do the things that the Holy Spirit wants to do that maybe we don't necessarily want to do or thinking about doing or even are prepared emotionally to do. The Holy Spirit oftentimes has called me into spontaneous situations where I haven't been prepared at all, where I'm exhausted, where I don't know what to say or do, but I just say, Holy Spirit, I'm opening my mouth. Fill it with your words. So it is for this, I guess I'm making this calling and this Uh, call to you all to respond to the call of the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit is calling us all to enter into a deeper walk with him so that he wants us to participate with him in his ministry. As his loving child, the Father wants to give you and me supernatural power to fulfill our calling. In Luke 11, Verses 10 and 13, it says, To everyone who asks, he will receive. He who seeks will find. Him who knocks, the door shall be opened. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So all you do need to do is to ask, believe, and receive. So I want to offer this to you right now. If you would like to enter into this with the Holy Spirit right now, pray with me. Father, I recognize my need for your power in my life to fulfill my calling. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. I welcome you now, Holy Spirit. By faith, I receive you. Thank you for baptizing me. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in my life. Lead me in all truth. Comfort me. Fill me with your power. Give me spiritual gifts. Guide me and use me to fulfill your purposes for my life. Amen. Congratulations. You have now welcomed the Holy Spirit to fill you with power. God bless you, and I hope you enjoyed this message.
pulled me from the ashes you have broken every curse blessed redeemer you have set this captive free lord i Yes. Sir. 